Hello, everybody. My name is Debbie Lynn Toomey, Tufts Medical Center's Injury Prevention Professional. And this is Aging Strong, which is the Tufts Medical Center's Injury Prevention and Outreach Program that aims to empower older adults with great information and resources that can really help their lives become healthier and happier and safer. And this program is sponsored by the Quincy Health Department. So today's topic is on older adult driving. And I just want to read a very quick um, information that I read from the Federal Highway Administration. According to them, there are more than 41 million licensed drivers age 65 and older on the roads these days. And that is up from 26 millions from 20 years ago. That is just really, it's almost doubled. So today's guest speaker is Mark Shieldrop from AAA Northeast. And he is the public affairs specialist for the AAA Northeast. Mark, welcome. Thank you very much. I appreciate being here. Thank you for being here. This is really a very important topic. And, you know, the the stats are just like staggering how many older adults are driving these days. And myself, I have two aging parents. Uh, One, uh, my father still wants to drive and he's 88. So, you know, I'm going to be listening with professional ears and also personal ears, if you don't mind me saying so. Um, So before you go and um, start your presentation. Can you just tell us a little bit about you and what your role is um, at AAA? Yes. So uh, again, my name is Mark Shieldrop. I'm uh, a trip uh, with AAA Northeast. I'm a public affairs specialist. I'm also a spokesperson for AAA. So you might recognize me from some of the interviews I've done recently on the high gas prices we've seen or travel. Uh, So I represent AAA out in the community, but I also do a lot of outreach work where I go to senior centers and schools and other community groups or to do presentations like this today to talk about traffic safety issues and topics that hopefully are relevant to people. So for the folks watching this at home or on the television, uh, hopefully you're an older driver and you're thinking about this or like you, Debbie, uh, you have parents who are aging and are starting to think about, you know, this is something that we need to consider as we age, our driving skills will change. Um, and your information, the data that you just provided is spot on. The, the reality is, is that Americans are living longer and we're driving much later in life. From the 60s to about now, the number of older drivers has increased almost exponentially. And the reality is, is that most people are outliving their driving abilities by about seven to 10 years. So that means that for the first time in our history, we really have to think about retiring from driving and planning our driving retirement as much as we need to think about planning our financial retirement. Mm -hmm. So this is a really timely topic today. And uh, I'm really excited to have this presentation and have this conversation with you. Wow. I, you just, you might, I just got goosebumps when you said that people are driving past their ability, really their safe ability to you know, drive their cars. That's really, really scary. So um, I look forward to your presentation. So please. Yeah, I'll dive right in. Um, So traffic safety is a large part of my job. And it's just really motivating uh, to help people think about their relationship with driving and kind of rethink it a little bit, because we tend to fall into patterns and routines, and we take driving for granted. And that can be a good thing in a way. But it's also something where we really need to sometimes take a step back and really evaluate where we stand. Uh, we, we really focus that a lot on new drivers and young drivers. We kind of explain our expectations with them. We monitor their progress. And we're very aware of the risks that young drivers face. But when it comes to older drivers, it can be a little bit of a difficult subject. Uh, but I really like working with older drivers. It's really rewarding. Um, but mainly, older drivers have been there. They've done that. And they've seen it all. So When I spend time with older drivers, whether it's through a presentation like this or at a council on aging or other community group, those older drivers are there because they want to be there. Uh, They want to find out ways to extend their driving career and uh, be safe while they're on the road. So we'll dive right into this little presentation. Um, Some facts about older drivers, you know, older drivers often, you know, they get a lot of flack out there on the roadway. People complain about older, older drivers clogging up the roads or driving too slow. Uh, They're also disproportionately represented in some media coverage of like low speed crashes or 
those in its incidents we see where somebody might confuse the brake pedal for the gas pedal and crashes into a building from a parking spot, those get a lot of attention and coverage, right? So it kind of shapes this perception of older drivers that, uh, you know, when older drivers are a, a danger on the road, but the truth is that older drivers are some of the safest on the road. Older drivers benefit from the wisdom of age and having a lifetime uh, to master driving and impulse control and risk management. These are things that come when you're a seasoned professional. And that's really what most older drivers are for a long chunk of their lives. They're the best drivers on the road. They follow the rules. Uh, they use seatbelts. Older drivers avoid putting themselves at risk. So honestly, if it were me, I would love to share the road with only older drivers because that would improve my safety as well. Uh, older drivers are less willing to drive aggressively or drive impaired. Uh, so re in reality, really what it boils down to is that older drivers are really good at self-regulating. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, a key point here where when someone's trying to extend their driving career, older drivers already kind of have that toolkit sitting there ready to use. We don't have to talk about impulse control and how to regulate yourself because you're already doing it. So really it's embracing what you're already good at and expanding on that to really make a, a, a smart assessment. So some key facts uh, to kind of highlight the point I just made, uh, older drivers between about 65 and 69 years old, which doesn't really seem that young these days, uh, but technically that's how we classify older drivers. You have the same crash rate as someone who's in their thirties and really 30 year old drivers are pretty much solid drivers, generally. Uh, the most dangerous and risk-taking drivers are younger, starting at driving age when you first get your license through your mid-20s. So we generally say it takes about five or more years for a novice driver to be able to consider themselves a skilled driver. So you can get a good sense who has uh, the most and least crashes by looking at insurance rates. So as older drivers know, their rates are going to be much lower than young drivers, and that's for good reason. Uh, older drivers, particularly those below 80, have the same crash uh, rate, number of crashes uh, it, per miles driven as 30-somethings. So the average person might not perceive the situation on the road as the data show. So if someone thinks that uh, someone between 65 and 80 has the same crash risk as someone between 35 and 40, uh, th they'd be right. Um, so what we need to think about when it comes to the risk for older drivers is that the survivability of those crashes is lower. So that's really the issue here. It's not about whether an older driver is more likely to be involved in a crash. We know that the crash risk is pretty low compared to other population groups. Um, but the survivability is the concern. And that has a lot to do with what happens to our bodies as we age. Bone fragility is one of the key concerns and the primary danger for older drivers. And that explains how lower speed crashes can be fatal or seriously injure an older driver, but not a younger driver. So another way to look at this is consider how we talk about fall risk as people age. So people in the medical community and people with older parents at home, there's a big concern about falling at home. And we know some of the negative consequences of that. So we talk about you know, fall proofing your home or making adaptations at home to reduce the risk of falling. We provide our loved ones with devices or watches that can communicate in the instance that a fall occurs so people can respond and help quickly. Um, so we've made a lot of improvements in that area because we recognize the risk. So when we talk about driving, there's a little bit of a parallel there. Um, so when I talk to young audiences, I often explain to them this fact. And even though it may not apply to them directly, I say, don't underestimate the risk of seriously injuring someone else in a low speed collision. So not only should we not speed to protect ourselves, but when we think about other drivers on the road that way, it makes us realize that, yeah, maybe it's not just about myself being put at risk. It's about what I'm going to do to other people if I do cause a crash. So some bumps and bruises and a broken bone, that might be a brief recovery for someone in their 20s, but that could be seriously uh, a bad situation for someone in their 80s, for example. So I tell folks, imagine that all the other drivers on the road are grandmothers and grandfathers just trying to get home. And by putting that mental image in your mind, you will start to adjust your own behavior thinking about that. Um, you know, uh, 
the risk is out there, you know, driving, we, we take driving for granted in this country, but in the United States, we have a big problem with crashes and fatalities and the rates have been going up uh, just in 2006, uh, I'm sorry, 2016, 200,000 drivers uh, between the ages of 65 and older were injured in crashes and more than 3,500 killed. So this is something we really want to um, reduce. So some uh, top five collision risks for drivers over 65. I have a little brief video animation I'm going to play. It's just a couple seconds, but it kind of really distills down the five situations that an older driver will encounter where they're going to have a higher crash risk. And these are the types of situations that we can try to avoid with a little bit of strategic planning. And we'll get into that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, so here we are. I'm playing this. Turning left across oncoming traffic. That's a big one. Uh, Left-hand turns are a major concern. And then turning right on a yield sign and merging with traffic. Then turning left from a stop sign where cross traffic does not stop. That's when you have a stop sign and nobody else does. And then changing lanes on a busy multi-lane highway or a busy multi-lane roadway and merging onto a highway. That's the other, I'd say, pain point for older drivers. So any older driver watching those clips probably can relate to the stress of approaching that situation and then realizing you're going to have to cross multiple lanes of cross traffic and maybe they don't have a stop sign and you do and and that's a difficult situation to navigate and as we get older we find those are the situations where the more you know more anxiety occurs and more stress occurs so for someone who's maybe starting to think that maybe their driving is becoming a little problematic or a family member who's beginning to get concerned about a loved one and their driving, there are some warning signs to look out for. Uh, unexplained dents and scrapes. So if you start noticing uh, a parent or a loved one's car have a, some damage and you ask about it and they're not sure about where it came from or they're not quite clear on how it happened, that's a warning sign. Often folks don't realize they might have bumped into somebody in a parking lot or, or scraped a, uh, a bollard or a pole uh, or maybe even backing into their own garage. You know, that that kind of situation can happen to any driver. But when we start to see this happening with someone who normally didn't have those types of situations, that's a, a concern. Uh, parking incorrectly. If it's just harder and harder to line up in that parking spot in a parking lot, that's an indication that there is a, a something to be thinking about. Driving too slowly for traffic, if you feel like everyone's flying by you all the time. And now, nowadays, we do have a big problem speeding. However, um, if you're having trouble going with the flow of traffic and if it's challenging for you, that's an indication that it's time to take an assessment. Uh, getting lost in familiar areas, delayed responses. As we age, our reaction times start to slow down. Uh, so older drivers using that self-regulation often will start increasing their following distance or slowing down a little bit to try to give themselves more time to react to situations. But there gets to a point where that slowing down and that self-regulation is actually starting to disrupt the flow of traffic and starting to sometimes create more risk for yourself. When you're that odd person driving not with the flow of traffic, that actually becomes a traffic hazard for other people, and that could lead to a crash. Um, nervous, angry, or confused. Look, I don't want to drive into downtown Boston in rush hour. Nobody does. That's nerve wracking and it's soul crushing sometimes. But oftentimes that anxiety can start to spill over into other routine trips that used to not be a challenge. So that's something to pay attention to. Um, and then the roadways are busy. There's a lot of lights and signs and all sorts of distractions out there. It becomes overwhelming for even skilled drivers. So when this becomes even more challenging, that's something else. And then uh, hearing difficulties, you know, our ears, as we age, our ears uh, stop working as well. And we really rely on our hearing quite a bit as we're driving. And it's one of those senses that we depend on in order to be a safe driver that we take for granted until our hearing begins to uh, have issues. So that's something as well. Um, when we want to kind of break down what these concerns are, in a sort of simple, clear way. I like to look at it this way. Uh, the three main issues that older drivers really need to, to think about are uh, issues with their vision, their cognitive issues. And that really just means, uh, you know, ability to process information, navigate unfamiliar areas, deal with all those traffic signs, uh, 
figuring out how to cross two lanes of traffic to make that left-hand turn, uh, those types of things. And then physical issues. As we age, our bodies change. Uh, oftentimes, we get a little shorter. Uh, we uh, often start to um, need a different configuration in our vehicle to be properly buckled and positioned for a safe driving. And uh, oftentimes, folks just kind of leave the car the way it's been all those years. And as their body changes, they're not making those adjustments in the vehicle at the same time. Also, a good safe driver will turn their head to check their blind spots. And driving requires some flexibility and endurance. It, even though you're sitting in the vehicle, you need coordination and good reflexes and able to check all your mirrors comfortably. So that's one of those things that you need to think about if you start to have difficulty checking those mirrors regularly, if you're having neck pain or you're unable to look uh, fluidly with, with your neck, uh, that's an issue. Um, so that's not the end of the world though. If you start to notice these warning signs or if you start to really come to terms with the fact that you have some of those vision, cognitive or physical issues, there are strategies that we can use to deal with those concerns or mitigate them significantly enough to really extend your driving career. And the point is, is that at AAA, we've done research on this. And we know that people who drive longer and later in their life tend to live longer and have better lives. And we're not saying that it's a direct one-to-one -one relationship. We're not saying that keep driving and you'll live longer. What we're saying is that there's a connection there, that happy, healthy people can drive longer. And also, when people do finally stop driving, that often comes at a time in their life where they have less social interaction with people, their outside world, their support network becomes a little more distant because let's face it, in this country, most people need a vehicle or they need a car or they don't happen to live in an area with good public transportation. So at the end of their driving career is often the end of a lot of their social life. And that is when people really begin to decline. So the longer people are in contact with other people, the longer they're socializing and participating in that community social network, they're going to live longer and have healthier, more enriching lives. So we like to try to help people extend their driving careers with that goal in mind. Mm -hmm. So if you, uh, those steps really are based on simple self-assessment and that being honest with yourself and honest with your family members, self-regulation, which is something we already are doing and just enhancing that a little bit and maybe making some more adjustments to be safe and then making a plan. Uh, so self-assessment, for one thing, get your eyes checked. Uh, a lot of folks, especially younger folks say, you know, older people need to be tested way more often to keep their licenses. They just give people licenses and they never make them check their eyes. And that's why we have unsafe older drivers. Well, to an extent, that may be true. But um, a lot of it is that folks need to be a little bit more aggressive and staying up to date with their prescriptions. So if you haven't had an eye exam in a long period of time, go out and get that done. You know, get it done sooner than later. You're eyeglass prescription may need updating. Uh, well, vision is one of those things that it kind of creeps up on you. And then one day you realize that your vision has deteriorated significantly in, in, in recent times. And you may be in denial about it, or, you know, our brains have an amazing ability to adapt. Uh, you may not realize how much your vision has deteriorated. Um, it's happening to me. I'm at the age now where I'm starting to really need glasses for the longest time I didn't, but now I'm actually needing reading glasses to read. And I'm starting to realize that I may need to get my eyes checked and maybe get a, a prescription for driving and, and other circumstances. It's not bad yet, but I'm starting to notice more and more that I'm needing to squint a little more. I, I'm, I need to move things around to see clearly. And it's dawning on me that at some point it may begin to progress enough where I need glasses. So I'm starting to think about that now. And I'm, I'm still a young guy, right? Uh, older folks, if it's been more than five to 10 years since your last eye exam, go out and get that done. Uh, that can make a world of difference. Is your car clean? You know, the, the mirrors and, and the windshield is a huge thing. Folks often don't realize how much film can build up on the inside of their windshield Many older drivers struggle to drive at night. Uh, they see the halos around the headlights. Sometimes that's your eyes and your vision, but often the windshield and the condition of that windshield is a big contributing factor to visibility. So clean that windshield off if it's older and there's a lot of uh, pock marks from road debris and sand and grit from driving. You may be, you know, consider a windshield replacement. Uh, that can make a huge difference. Uh, 
check your tires and your seatbelt positioning. You know, many folks are driving with tires that are way too old. That's a pretty straightforward mm-hmm. advice that we give to all drivers. Uh, people tend to drive on older tires way too long. And then I mentioned CarFit. CarFit is a program. It's a national program where folks can have a really detailed assessment of their car and its fitment. And you're guided into making adjustments in order to make sure you drive safely. And the two big things that I'll say now that are easy to do yourself, you don't need a car fit event, although I highly recommend going to the car fit website and finding a car fit event near you and going to it. Um, but most folks or many folks uh, don't realize that their seatbelt needs to be positioned properly. So quick thing, hop in your car. If your seatbelt is not going right across your shoulder, make that adjustment. Many cars nowadays, you can adjust the height of the, the, the belt right there by the door. So sit in your car. If that belt isn't going right across your, your shoulder, across your breast right there, uh, you need to make that adjustment. We find that a lot of folks... It goes across their neck. It shouldn't be touching your neck at all. That's that's going to be a big problem in a crash. So lower that. And the other thing is mirrors. Many folks don't have their mirrors properly positioned. Your side mirrors, especially. Many folks have them pointed inward. That's not really going to help your visibility. So when you're in your car, sit in the driveway, look in your rear view mirror, make sure that rear view mirror is properly adjusted, and then make note of where the visibility of your rear view mirror ends on the left and ends on the right. And then not moving your head at all from sitting in the driver's seat, adjust those side mirrors so that way your rear view mirror view picks up right from where it left off in your rear view mirror to your side mirror on the left and your side on the right. So essentially you're creating a panoramic view from left to right as far as possible using all your mirrors. So that way as you're driving, you can glance to your right or glance to your left and really get a good view of what your blind spot would be. You're still going to want to turn your head when you're changing lanes, but just making that adjustment, you will see that you have dramatically improved visibility around your car, and that'll make a big difference. If you can lean over and look in your side mirror and see your own face, that's a clear sign that it's pointing too much inward. Uh, Dust off that owner's manual. If your owner's manual is still in your glove box, get that owner's manual out. uh, Read it before bed. There's all sorts of safety features in your car and uh, technology in your car that you may not really feel comfortable operating or even know exists. So go through that, master your vehicle, stretch and exercise, uh, get a sense of your physical capabilities. If you uh, just do some simple stretching exercises, that, that alone can really help limber you up before you drive somewhere, it can make a big difference. And the other uh, point I want to make is that as part of your self-assessment, you have to be honest re- with yourself. It's really hard. That's one of those things that I'm not a, a licensed professional. I don't know how to convince someone to be honest with themselves. Humans have an amazing ability to kind of be in denial about certain things. We we often are stubborn. You know, this is a challenge we face with other drivers, especially, hey, it's been working all these years. You know, why change now? Um, but Many folks are aware, uh, and and it's those warning signs that we're talking about. If they're noticing them, those warning signs, uh, warning signs themselves, they're honest with themselves. They know something's up. Don't be afraid to have that conversation with people. So, self regulation. That's really your your big toolkit here, and this is really the the meat or the heart of this presentation. And that's what's going to keep you safe. And that's what's going to extend your driving career is this ability to self-regulate. So I've got this image of this empty road in the middle of nowhere with a traffic sign. And to me, that's a symbol of how you can control the environment around you. So I say, take the road less traveled. You know, why force yourself into stressful circumstances? So we're creatures of habit. We tend to just follow the same route every day. We always take the same way to go to the grocery store. And we just have our routines and that's how we do it. Um, But I often will, when I'm talking with older drivers, I'll say, well, I'll ask them, when's the last time you actually sat down and planned out a route and tried to pick a route that was a little bit more off the beaten path, right? Um, Oftentimes we force ourselves into the more challenging driving situation when there's an alternative. So if there's a main road and you have to take a left across multiple lanes of traffic and there are cars coming and it's stressful for you. Well, maybe there's a way to approach that intersection from a different direction. What if you take a back road and come around 
another way. So that way you're one of those people coming from the other direction. And so instead of having to take those two left turns or that left turn, you can take multiple right turns instead. Um, in fact, I think FedEx or UPS, one of those companies put into their algorithm and their route planning to only make right turns. Now, sometimes they still have to make a left turn, but they found that if they program their computers to focus on always taking right turns and adjusting the delivery route so that way the driver was only taking right turns whenever possible, they found that the crash rates of their drivers fell significantly. So we know that left turns are more dangerous. So can you do that too? So pull out a mapping app on your phone or get on the computer or even dust off your old Rand McDowney maps, or even you have some AAA maps at home and take a look at your town or your community or your common destinations and think to yourself, could I get there with a much easier, much more relaxed route? It might take a few more miles or another five to 10 minutes to get there, but in the end, you're more comfortable and it's safer and less stressful. By making those types of adjustments, you can really make driving less of a stressful situation. You can actually look forward to driving again. Um, older folks are really good at not driving at night or in bad weather. A lot of that has to do with not being comfortable driving at night because of vision issues. We need way more light in order to see uh, as we get older, upwards of 40 to 50% by the time we're 40 or 50 years old, as compared to when we were 18 years old. So that's why it's so much harder to see at night. It's just a natural consequence of aging. So older folks tend to drive less at night. So keep doing that. That's a, that's a great thing. If, if you are driving at night and you're not a big fan of it, maybe you don't have to necessarily drive at night. So maybe go out for that dinner date with your friends an hour earlier. Uh, or, and then so that way you're coming home at dusk instead of at nine o'clock at night. Um, avoiding highways and rush hour. That kind of speaks to the first point I made about finding different routes. But there is often a longer less stressful way. Uh, so avoiding that highway and taking back roads, that's a preferred way to travel as we get older. Uh, and then, you know, use technologies and uh, maps to, to find less stressful routes and switch up driving responsibilities. This is a big issue we have with some of the older generations, the greatest generation in particular, the men like to do the driving. A lot of times the women have a hard time saying, you know what, I'm going to drive. Uh, sometimes out of necessity, that is what happens, but we encourage people to start practicing that before it becomes ne necessity. Uh, cause oftentimes the, the woman in the relationship who has not been doing the driving all these years is suddenly forced to do the driving. And that may be something where if we had only switched for driving responsibilities a little bit more a few years earlier, it would be less of a stressful situation for the other partner in the relationship that now has to pick up some of that additional driving responsibility. We find this a lot when, say, the husband has an injury and has to go through physical therapy and is no longer able to drive for a period of time until they're certified okay to drive again. The wife has to pick up the driving tasks. And if they're not in good practice, that can be an issue. So the sooner you can get practice on sharing responsibilities, the better. It also kind of lightens the load a little bit. So you, so the, one of the drivers, um, you know, has a little bit of time to relax and not have to drive every single time we're spreading out the tasks a little bit more. We're lightening the load and, and event ultimately we're hoping we're extending our driving careers long and short of it. Eventually all the strategies and all the techniques, eventually they may not really be as effective as we'd like. And this is where we have to talk about maybe planning our driving retirement. And this is a difficult conversation for families. Uh, it's one of those things that often happens suddenly, or there's a, a life event that occurs where this decision has to be made, no questions immediately. And that's really tough. What we try to encourage people to do is to start thinking about it before we get to that point. Um, and again, it's difficult. Older folks can be pretty stubborn and set in their ways. And and they don't want to hear it. They don't want to be told that it's not good for them to be driving anymore, or they don't want to worry their family. But they also, the main thing is they don't want to lose their independence. Because as we said earlier, the longer people drive, the happier they tend to be, the longer their lives tend to be. So there is a feeling of helplessness when the keys are taken away and they can't drive anymore. That really, in a lot of ways, is is a sentence. And, and folks will try to avoid that as much as possible. And oftentimes that that leads to deception or not being straightforward about what's really going on out there and, or being a denial. And 
uh, hopefully not a cognitive issue where they're not even aware of how bad it's getting. But unfortunately, that that does happen. Um, so we at AAA have developed a program to help families through this process. It's uh, a website dedicated to this, and I've got the, the website address right there. And you can go there. And what I recommend doing is downloading our Senior Mobility Planning Toolkit. It's a comprehensive document, and you can print it out. And what it does is it, it helps walk a family through this process starting on day one and the conversations that you need to take place with suggested talking points and ways to approach this conversation. It also has helpful guides on planning the life outside of driving and planning that driving retirement. So that way you can start finding what public transportation options are out there in that community. If you have a loved one that lives in a community that is blessed with a, a wonderful council on aging, sometimes they have transport services for their members to help their members get to and from the council on aging headquarters or some shopping trips during the day. There's, there's resources in many communities that, that older folks can tap into. And they may not even be aware of it, especially if they're independent up to that point. And the family may not be aware of all the resources available. So it helps you build that sort of cheat sheet on how that family member is going to get around and still maintain their active lifestyle, even if they don't have the ability to drive anymore. And um, another thing I highly recommend is, and a lot of older folks do this, is sign up for a defensive driving course. So we offer them at AAA. They're much more popular in other states than Massachusetts, mainly because in other states you can get an insurance discount if you pass one of those courses. In Massachusetts, there is an automatic discount for senior citizens, so the demand isn't there. That doesn't mean you can't take the course, and many folks who've been driving for many years discover that they've learned something really valuable in one of those programs. So definitely something to consider. But the uh, Senior Mobility Planning Toolkit is really an incredible resource, and I highly recommend everybody go and download it and start going through it, even if you don't stick to it, um, you know, page by page, at least it can give you some thoughts and talking points to begin to have that conversation. Uh, but it's really important for the whole family to get involved. And I caution setting it up like an intervention. You don't want the older driver to feel like they're being attacked or overwhelmed by everyone. It has to be something that they're on board with and part of. So ideally, you get a family member take the lead on it and start to have that conversation. Um, and it's one of those things where you often have to kind of ease someone into the process, but it's important to start thinking about it early because it is something that will happen unexpectedly on a personal note. You know, I have a, my father, he's getting a little older and he had a medical issue last year. And um, thankfully he came through it fine. Uh, he's doing really well now, but there was significant impact. It was a brain injury. Um, and, it, it has affected his driving. He's driving now again, but he's driving a lot with my mom and my mom's taking on a lot of the load. And it was a bit of a wake up call for us to realize that, hey, you know, me and my, my siblings realized like, oh, our folks are getting older and, you know, we can't just kind of count on them trucking along, no problem over there. And we're going to have to take a little bit more active role in, in that type of thing going forward. And it takes some sacrifice because we're all busy with our own lives and we have our own kids and families and you know, we often depended on our parents to help us out and look out for us. And, you know, it's it's tough when when you start thinking that, you know, the roles are starting to change a little bit. So for the younger audience out there with parents, you know, now's the time to kind of get the ball rolling on that. It doesn't mean you're taking the keys away next week. It means that we're starting the conversation now and we're planting those seeds. So that way we can we can make sure our loved ones are driving safe. For many years to come. Uh, so I put my email address here. You can always reach out to me directly. If you are part of a council on aging and you'd like me to come and give a talk to your, your members or your friends, I'm more than happy to come. Uh, you can also reach out to me with any personal questions you have, and I can do my best to uh, guide you to resources that we have. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to share some of my thoughts on this and uh, safe driving, everyone. <laughs> Wow, that's great, Mark. Thank you. I will definitely go on the web and uh, download the AAA.com slash key timing. I didn't, I've never heard of that. That's really, really amazing to, uh, to offer that for especially, you know, um, older adults who are taking care of their parents or, you know, being their primary caregiver. 
So my sisters and I have been taking turns, taking my parents back and forth uh, for their appointments. Um, and, you know, it does take time out of our, our lives, but it's the way it is right now, you know? So, uh, yeah. and um, it's uh, to, to be able to do that is a privilege uh, for our parents. So it is. I do have some questions for you. Yes. You covered a lot of great information. So um, what can you do if an older driver, family member or a friend, um, if they're in denial about declining their driving ability and is unwilling to have that difficult conversation? They're just very stubborn. I know how to drive. I've been driving for over 60 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's tough, uh, especially sometimes a family member has a little bit of a disadvantage, uh, especially in the child parent relationship where, you know, the parents used to always be in boss. And there's something to be said about a third party, an objective observer. So my advice is think about who in that parent's life do they trust? And a lot of times that's a family physician or a doctor. Uh, we saw during COVID people who were maybe hesitant about getting vaccines, one effective strategy was get the doctor to talk to them about it and answer their questions. And some of their fears about the vaccine, you know, was it rushed? Was it too soon? You know, not enough testing. The doctor can lay out, you know, here's what the facts are. As a medical professional, this is what I think. And often that's enough to get that person to turn the corner. So family physician often just asking some pointed questions, you know, are you still driving? Uh, you know, have you been involved in any fender benders? You know, are you comfortable driving? Um, it's a way to begin that conversation with a trusted professional. That way you're kind of breaking the ice a little bit. And then the family can start to follow up on that. And then may, you may have to go outside of your comfort zone and reach out to that doctor and say, look, you know, my father or my mother is a patient of yours. We're having some concerns. Is there any way you can help us out with this and maybe even use that senior mobility planning toolkit with some talking points and, and have that conversation with that physician. Now that takes time and effort and hopefully you can find a, a, an objective professional or somebody in their life who who's, can get on board with this. But chances are you will have success because in reality, these folks care about your parents just like you do, especially if they've had a long, lifelong relationship with them. Uh, I would also, you know, talk to neighbors. It, 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 of course, every situation is different. But if you have a, a neighbor next door who you have a good relationship with it, who knows your folks, uh, and, you know, they can kind of keep a little bit of an eye on them for you. You can reach out to them. And, you know, you never know. It could even just be a conversation while someone's out in the garden being like, hey, you're still driving. You know, I saw a little scrape on your bumper. What happened over there? You know, and 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 kind of continue that conversation along. It can take months, if not years before it starts to sink in. Um, but that can really be helpful. Oftentimes that third party is mm -hmm. really uh, the key to getting that conversation going. And then the family can step up and say, oh yeah, you know, we heard you talking about that. And um, we were thinking about that too. Instead of full frontal assault, you know, the family's intervening, we're taking the keys away. Um, the famed columnist and 60 Minutes presenter, Andy Rooney, um, he's passed on, but uh, my colleague uh, knew the family really well and uh, had a funny story about him is that as he got older, his family realized it was unsafe for him to drive. So they took his keys away. And Andy Rooney, being the stubborn guy he was, uh, literally took the bus to the car dealership and bought a brand new Cadillac with cash and drove it home like the next day. So the family came home and saw a brand new car in the driveway and he had the keys. He said, no, nah, I just bought a new one. You know, he had the resources to do that. He was Andy Rooney, obviously. But it just goes to show you that just yanking the keys away without a plan can backfire, you know? So you have to get them to be on board with it. And the easiest way is to kind of ease them into it and show them, hey, you know, you can still get around. We can take turns driving. We can take you to this place that you go to every week for you. I'll take a day off work and bring you there. Uh, we're going to build a support ne network around you to get you where you need to go so you don't feel like you're giving up your life. And that's really the key thing. So some families, it's going to be harder for some families than others. And it really depends on that support network. 
Yeah, that's a very robust answer right there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, clearly, in the, you know, the primary care physician, you know, they are the, you know, they're the person, the doctor, uh, the person in charge of health and safety, you know, people will listen. Um, but doctors also, you know, they struggle how they're going to approach that, um, you know, with their patients trying to get a good assessment, asking them, you know, how did you get to your appointment today? Did you get a ride? Did you take the bus? Oh, how long have you been driving? And, you know, so, you know, all these different questions that they have to kind of creatively ask without, you know, pointing the finger or trying to tell their patient that, okay, it's time. Yeah, exactly. It does take a village. And that's why having that conversation with that physician ahead of time, it's going to make it easier for them to broach the subject. And also knowing that the family is going to be kind of back home supporting what the physician said. It just makes everyone feel more confident that they're going to be able to get through and and have success in getting this conversation going. Yeah, and the value of having great neighbors who are there for your parents when you can't be there 24-7. That is just so, so valuable. Exactly. And one thing we haven't really talked about is where your loved one lives, you know, so if you don't have good neighbors, if they live in a place where they're going to have to be driving nonstop to get anywhere, just like when we talk about fall risk, Mm -hmm. you know, you can make modifications to the home, but it's not an easy conversation, but eventually, you know, maybe, maybe it's time for mom and dad to think about not living in this spot that has so many challenges, you know, so I don't, I don't have good advice on that. That's a, that's a tough, tough situation. Uh, to figure out. Um, But driving goes hand in hand with that. So if you're at the point where you're talking about those kinds of topics already, Mm -hmm. driving should be on the table as well. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And this is not per se driving related, but, you know, while it's in my mind, uh, when I do take my my mom and my dad um, uh, grocery shopping or even, you know, wherever we need to go, when I, when I do park, I always tell them to look behind them to see if there's a car that's going to be parking next to the our car on their side so that they don't hit, you know, that car or that car doesn't, you know, hit them as they're coming out. So, you know, just, just that little side aside as far as safety goes when you're in a vehicle. Yes. Uh, yeah. So much, you know, to think about because um, the world, it seems to be, you know, it's, Time is fast. People seem to be driving faster also. Yeah. Yeah. So has AAA um, done any type of um, metrics or determination how much people have driven faster because um, when we've been during lockdown, during COVID? Yes. So we haven't studied that specifically directly ourselves. However, we've, we've been looking at the data over the last few years. And we've also been listening and working with um, the state, uh, the highway department, executive office of highway safety, and police departments. And there's no question that speeding is an epidemic right now, uh, to put it bluntly. Um, During the pandemic, for example, in 2020, at the height of lockdowns, traffic volumes across the country and in Massachusetts fell by roughly half Mm -hmm. Yet the number of crashes and fatalities stayed the same. Uh, That likely is due to speeding. So we heard these stories of people driving 100 100 plus miles an hour on the highway and crashing because there's no traffic volume. Uh, What's happened is now that the volume has returned, we're like pretty close to where we were before the pandemic in terms of traffic volume. And the speeding has continued. Uh, for the first time in decades, the number of crashes and fatalities in the United States has been increasing year over year for the last few years. And that's a really alarming signal to us that something's wrong with our driving culture. And speeding is really one of the leading causes. So impaired driving remains an issue. Drowsy driving is an issue. Aggressive driving is an issue. But it's the, the speeding seems to be one of the main driving forces of it right now. Because when you speed, the crashes are going to be more violent. The fatality rates are much higher. The survivability is much lower. I mean, if you think about your crash risk increasing by almost 50% driving from 55 miles an hour as compared to driving 65 miles an hour. And then when you drive 75 miles an hour, you know, your fatality rate 
doubles from there and it increases exponentially. So if you're driving 100 miles an hour and you get involved in a crash, very low survivability risk, even with modern cars, with all the latest safety gadgets and whatnot, that's yeah. not going to protect you at those types of speeds. Uh, so speeding is a massive concern, especially for older folks that are maybe driving slow uh, because the speeder has so much little time to react because of their decision to speed. Um, so you're putting other drivers at risk. Like I mentioned before, when I talk to younger folks, I say, it's not just about you, you know, it's about your mom and dad and, you know, the baby in the back seat. you're putting everybody at risk, not just yourself. You know, it's a very selfish act to speed. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so the speeding is a big problem and uh, it continues to be, and police, you know, say they're still seeing people drive like that. I see it myself when I, when I drive anywhere. People yeah. are driving way too fast for the conditions. And, yeah. you know, I don't really know what we can do to change people's behavior. It seems to be a cultural issue in a lot of ways. It's yeah. a problem that's unique to America. This isn't a global phenomenon. This is an America problem. Yeah. Uh, we have a big problem on our roadways. And my, my advice is it starts with us. So I don't speed. I leave early so I don't feel panic or rushed. And I urge everyone in my life to do the same. And, and all I can do is share the data and practice what I preach and hope that other folks follow suit and join me in trying to be safer and respectful to my fellow citizens on the road. Yeah, well said, well said. I mean, not only speed, I notice impatience. You know, there's people who are just like weaving in and out, in and out, in and out. And it's just... Um, it's distracting. It's worrisome because you you're thinking that okay, this person, I don't know if they're there's an there's an emergency or they're just impatient or maybe they're under the influence of something, and you know for me to anticipate maybe potentially a big car accident caused by that car ahead of me. So it's just um, you know there's just so much to think about as a person driving behind the wheel, and I can you know, for older adults, it can be very, very overwhelming and intimidating to be yes. driving at, um, you know, dusk or when it's um, during high traffic time. So, you know, I love how you said, you know, just making sure that, you know, you drive in the road less traveled and just kind of maybe going out of your way or, you know, making sure it's during the daytime that you're going. So just really being aware of um, where you're going and the traffic conditions, even the weather conditions, very important to know. Absolutely. Yeah. Rain, driving in the rain is difficult, especially when your, your eyes are, are a little bit older. Uh, you know, I tell older folks, you earned a great spot in your life. You've been around a long time. You've worked hard. Guess what? You earned the right to say no. So if someone says we need you here at night, nope, not doing it. Sorry. No, you know, I, I'm not going to drive then. That's it. Period. And yeah. guess what? The rest of the world has to adapt to you because you're in control. You are in control. You know, uh, if it's raining on Wednesday and you have a doctor's appointment on Wednesday, call Monday and say, I want to reschedule. There's rain in the forecast. You know what? The doctor's office has to reschedule. That's all there is to it. You know, granted, there are emergencies. There are times where you absolutely have to get out. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's always an alternative grocery yeah. delivery. If you've never done it, you know, that's an alternative. During the pandemic, a lot of people discovered that you can get a lot done from home. Like this conversation we're having now virtually, mm -hmm. it may have had to be recorded in person a few years ago. So the beauty of technology and, and modern times, there are solutions to, to that. And you're right. You know, people are more aggressive and impatient out there. Something happens when people get into a vehicle where they kind of lose their humanity, it seems. Yeah. You could be screaming and yelling at somebody and, and, and angry and, you know, all this tension. And then you park your car and then you're holding the door open for your fellow traveler who you were just yelling at while in the car, you know? So something happens when we get in the car psychologically. And, you know, I think when we're aware of it, we can improve our own behavior and be mindful of others. And that's, you're, you're right. You know, it's, it's overwhelming out there, even for someone like me who, you know, I feel comfortable driving, but, over the last few years, I've been less comfortable just because I see other people putting mm -hmm. themselves and others at such risk. Mm -hmm. So that's why keeping that safe following distance is important. Uh, no distractions, you know, no phone use, you know, keep, keep the distractions to a minimum and checking my mirrors. You know, I, 
I try to visualize my car from a bird's eye perspective. So when I check my mirrors, oftentimes you'll kind of identify that lean weaver way back in your rear view mirror. You'll kind of see a car darting between traffic. So to me, that's a signal. This person's going to be coming up on me in a little bit. And that way, when they blow by me and cut right in front of me, I was kind of ready for them. Like I knew they would be coming up, so I'm not caught off guard. Uh, so, you know, as you get older, it's a little bit harder to stay on top of the situation like that in real time and be able to anticipate those things. So that's why we say, you know, hey, avoid the highway if you can. Now, the highway is generally a safer place than, than small roads, mainly because you've got that divider uh, preventing oncoming vehicles from coming to your lane. Uh, and, and there's less cross traffic and that sort of thing. Hey, it's a highway, right? Uh, but as we get older, that speed becomes a concern and the highways are busy around here. There's no question about it. Um, so those back roads are often a great alternative. If you're still in decent driving shape, uh, just cause you're reduced the speeds a lot and, and you don't have to deal with those crazy drivers crossing lanes and getting in your way. Yeah. So definitely, you know, re not taking the highway is a great alternative. I do it myself. I take the long way in a lot of places around where I live just because I prefer the easier route, even if it takes a little bit longer. So, and often I find that the longer route has less traffic because everybody takes the shortest route from point A to point B ah. and that creates congestion there. So many folks are just living by what the GPS tells them. So sometimes the GPS isn't going to put you in the best situation and planning the route ahead of time and ignoring the GPS recommendation is going to give you a much more pleasant and comfortable drive. That's a very good point about taking that the longer route. And sometimes the longer route actually is a nicer, easier drive, you know, so it's and you get to kind of, you know, admire the scenery, the view a little bit better. Yeah. And you can pull up, pull over if you need to, if you, you know, especially if you get that phone call while you're driving, you know, so you yeah, want to pull over, yeah. you know, when you have a chance to be able to answer it if you want to. That's right. And you might find a farm stand you didn't know existed, you know, and you can get some local honey or, or something like that. It's amazing what lurks just a street over that you'd never discover unless you took the longer route. So yeah. well there's other advantages. Oh my gosh, this time is flying by. I, <laughs> I have more questions. I don't know if I'll have a chance to uh, ask my questions, but okay. So as far as older adults and they're maybe in going into their seventies and maybe going, getting up through the eighties, what are some small things an older adult can do to make themselves safer behind the wheel? Yeah. So I, I mentioned a few of these strategies in the presentation. Uh, the main thing is car fitment is key. All too often, I see older drivers with the steering wheel right up against them. The, the shoulder belt is crossing their neck or they're not high enough. Uh, they're barely seeing over the steering wheel. Uh, that's an indication that someone needs to sit with them and say, okay, let's raise your seat your seat adjustments. Uh, let's lower the steering wheel. Let's find a, a correct driving position. Let's adjust that seatbelt. Uh, small adjustments like that can make a world of difference. A lot of folks who struggle with the pedals often is because they're not reaching the pedals close enough. Uh, so they may be some adjustments where pushing the steering wheel in and moving the seat forward will keep that safe distance between yourself and the steering wheel, which should be about a foot away from your chest for the airbag to give the airbag room to deploy. Uh, so some adjustments like that can really make a big difference. Um, you know, mirrors, well, we talked about adjusting the mirrors. We talked about really mastering your vehicle and going through the owner's manual. Many older drivers get overwhelmed by all the beeping and the signals, especially in newer cars nowadays with the lane departure warnings that get set off, uh, and all the other safety equipment that's, that's there. Uh, we see people driving at night with only their uh, automatic uh, daytime running lights on, but the lights aren't actually on. So the taillights aren't illuminated. We see that at night a lot uh, because you almost think your lights are on because you still can see because of the daytime running lights, but your lights are actually not on. So by going through the odorance manual, you may realize that there are settings that you're not using properly or safety features that are, aren't even engaged or something is a major distraction that you'd like to turn off. Well, there's a way to do that in the car. So Folks don't read their owner's manuals often enough. So that's something to do. The other recommendation, and this might seem silly for some folks, is practice. Find an empty parking lot, 
practice parking. Just remind yourself, here's how I'm going to do it. Uh, approaching the angle, uh, back into a spot. We, we often recommend folks back in the parking spaces. So that way, when you're leaving the parking space, you have way more visibility and there's much less car that you have to actually push out into the travel lane before you can finally see what you're doing. If you think of when you're back, when you pull into a spot and you have to back out, you know, you're, you're kind of looking through the back window, you're backing up, you know, you're putting the trunk up there. You still can't see, you can't see until you're out and then you realize cars are coming. So mm-hmm. by backing into the spot, yeah. you can start to inch out forward. You have way, you're, you're able to see much more, uh, much sooner. Uh, so it's a good thing to get in the habit of doing. And it takes practice. Just like we tell young drivers, go to a parking lot, practice parallel parking, uh, practice braking hard, practice you know, navigating around cones. So those defensive driving classes, those skid classes, you know, think of driving like any other skill that you have. It takes practice to really be a master of it. And mm-hmm. our skills can decline as we get older, but we adapt. If we think about the sports analogy, Tom Brady, I mean, he should have retired 10 years ago based on normal NFL statistical data that we have. Mm-hmm. But he's made adaptations to stay healthier longer, to stay on top of his game longer. Yeah. You think about a pitcher, you know, who pitches into their 40s, they're not going to be throwing 102 mile an hour fastballs when they're 39 years old and have been in the majors for 20 years. They're going to have to learn to be a finesse pitcher and mix up their pitches and kind of get into the psychology of psyching out a batter to stay successful in Major League Baseball. Well, they've adapted. They've accepted the fact that they don't have the body of an 18 to 21 year old who can throw 102 miles an hour, but they have the wisdom of pitching in the big leagues for all those years and they can they can still be a, mm-hmm. a really good master of their craft. So treat your driving the same way. Yeah. Um, and then also, stretching, stretching is key. And then also play video games. I mean, that seems counterintuitive, but there's a lot of research that shows that people that play video games and they don't have to be, you know, blow up everything in sight. They can be puzzle games or Wordle, which is really popular right now. Um, any type of activity that challenges your brain and forces you to problem solve and 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 figure things out is exercising your mind. And it's keeping you at a frame of mind where when you're driving, you're able to handle situations and react a little bit quicker and not get so overwhelmed by all that sensory input. So video games are a great thing to do. And yeah. drive with friends, have a passenger out there, have a navigator. If two old fo- older folks live in the same town, they both have their grocery store and they're both driving by themselves and they're both uncomfortable. Wouldn't it be great if they can team up and be together and, and, and one less car on the road, but they can look out for each other. So try to forge new relationships and, and see if that, that can be something that can be done. Yeah. Um, well said. Being, being mindful of it and thinking about it is step one. And once you start thinking about it, a lot of strategies start to unfold organically. Yeah. Well said. And I'm sure you meant not driving and playing video games, right? <laughs> not at the same time, no. And it doesn't have to be a driving game either. It can be a puzzle game or anything. But yes, definitely in the safety and comfort of home, on your iPad, you know, you don't have to run out and buy an Xbox or anything like that. Uh, most of us have a smartphone or an iPad or something like that these days. There's yeah. plenty of opportunities there. To help with coordination and just thinking, cognitive function. Let's get a grandchild to say, you know, hey, what's a game for grandma and grandpa? Come on, come on over here, show me. Let's play together. You know, get a get a young one on board, and they might have fun picking games for grandma and grandpa to play. Yeah, and be surprised how engaging it is. It's not a waste of time. It's exercising your brain. Mark AAA of Northeast, I want to thank you for today's program. I hope a lot of the viewers out there got as much out of this presentation as I did. Um, So thank you. And I wanna thank the Quincy Health Department for our partnership and doing this uh, program with Aging Strong. Take care, Mark, thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye everyone.